today as we come to the table. Now, I know saying all this again and knowing that we're the leader of our homes can add added pressure and stress. However, we need to understand that God will never ask us to do anything He's not given us the ability to do. You know, there are things that God asks us to do that if we put off on our wife, she's not going to be able to do that well, not because she's not as smart or doesn't maybe have the ability to some degree, but God has not given her what she needs to do that. God has given you as the husband to do that and vice versa. It goes both ways. We have different callings and different abilities God gives us. But we don't need to freak out. We need to realize that the Lord is the one that gives us this responsibility. He'll also be the one that gives us the strength and the ability to carry out the job. We've all been in a situation that seemed impossible to handle, only to succeed and overcome it. Whether at work or in everyday life, there are always situations that appear impossible to us, but God gives us the strength to overcome them, even in marriage. Difficult situations may arise for you or your spouse at times. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. What are your options? Pastor Mark explains in today's message how God gives you and your spouse the responsibilities that He wants you both to take. Even if the responsibility appears to be a difficult situation, God provides you with the strength and ability to succeed. God will never give you more than you can handle. Ephesians chapter 5. Now remember, we're not done with Genesis. We're taking a small detour. Next week, we'll get back in Genesis. Uh, But right now, this will be our last week of looking at the Bible. Uh, We Last week, we looked at the Bible, God's instruction manual for marriage. And that's what we looked at previously. Uh, Now we look at the Bible, God's instruction manual for marriage, part two. And we look at husbands. And so we're in Ephesians chapter 5 today. And uh, why don't we read this together? Uh, We'll be starting in verse 25, and we'll go all the way to the end. Notice it says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and his flesh and his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, again, once again, as we come to hear your word, Lord, to be instructed. Truly, your Bible is the instruction manual. And Lord, again, as we were instructed last week as how to be a godly wife, this week, Lord, we focus in on on husbands. And I pray, Lord, that first and foremost, that you would show us as husbands what we are to be, but not just gaining instruction, Lord, we might gain relationship with you. And through that, Lord, gain greater relationship with our wives that we may love them, Lord, even as you love us. And so I thank you for the instruction, but God, I pray that more than that, it would be relational. And Lord, again, even as we are ministered to as husbands today, Lord, I know that your word is alive and breathing. And so I pray now that you would use your word to minister to the wives as well and to minister to the single men and the single women and those that may be teens and college students, whatever the case might be, Lord, we pray that your word would now just minister to all of us in what our need is. And we know, God, that you are more than able, and that is your desire. So we open our hearts to you and look for you to do great things through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we looked at wives and God's instruction to them. This week, 
guys, it's our turn. So, you know, although both husband and wife share the responsibility before God concerning the marriage relationship, God holds the man the most accountable. And God holds the man the most responsible. Now, why is that? Well, because God created man to be the leader. Remember, we saw in Genesis, as we've been looking at, God created man first, and then he created woman to be his helper. And so, since man is the leader and the wife is to be his helper, the leader is always held more accountable, always, in every area of the marriage and in every area of life. That is just the way it's set up. We see that even today. You know, when the president, when something goes wrong with the government, who's the one everybody looks at? (laughs) Of course, in our nation, now anything goes wrong. Who's the one everybody looks at? The president. So the bottom line is, is that, and the reason being is he holds a position of authority over our nation. And so everyone looks to him to be the one that's accountable. And although he can't control everything from the position he's in, there is a lot of merit to the accountability that a president or any other leader is held to. And the same is true to the husband in our homes. We are held accountable for our own families. We're held accountable for our wives, our children, our own homes. And so we're expected to lead. We're expected to set the example. We're expected to be the ones that have to give the answers when something goes wrong. And, of course, we can rejoice the most when something goes right. You know, before I was a senior pastor, I was an assistant pastor for about five years. And to be honest, it's a lot easier position being the one that helps. Now, I'm not saying that to any way lessen what the wives are going through, but I'm saying in many ways it's a more desirable and safer position to be the one that, you know, is not the one held accountable and responsible. And some of you husbands, even this, we're beginning to talk about this. You get a love in your throat saying, man, I'm the one most accountable. Yes, God's going to hold you the most accountable when you stand before him. And yet to be in that position of the support, you know, I've, I've actually gotten to experience both being an assistant pastor and the senior pastor, if you will. But I found as the assistant pastor, it's a lot easier in tough situations because, you know, the one that's the, the main leader takes the heat. You know, he's the one that's got to answer for whatever really is going on or what's going wrong or whatever's, whatever needs to be dealt with. It all falls to him. And yet I found as a senior pastor, there's a greater responsibility, but there's also a greater joy in seeing God do uh, exciting things. And the same is true in the relation of the husband and wife relationship. As a wife, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, to have the responsibility fall on the husband. Because wives, again, let me remind you, as we've touched on here over the last few weeks, if your husband does something that is not really the best for your family, God doesn't hold you accountable for that. God's not going to come to you and say, now, why did you make that decision for your family to move there or for your kids to attend there or to have this form of of discipline in your home? Why did you choose that, wives? He's not going to say that, but he is going to say, husbands, why did you do that? And so that's why we as wives, you know, as an assistant pastor, what I learned was is that the one that was over me, you know, he's the one that had to carry the heaviest load. So I wanted to be an encourager to him. I wanted to be a support to him. I didn't want to make his job harder. I wanted to make it easier. And whether or not I agreed was not the point. The point was he's going to be the one held accountable. God's not going to hold me accountable except for the things I'm held accountable for. But at the same time, that puts pressure on the senior pastor and that puts pressure on the husband to say, you know what? I realize that I am accountable to God and therefore I've got to answer to him. So I've got to make sure I do this thing the right way. So wives understand by helping and supporting your husband in that, even if your husband makes a bad decision or doesn't lead in the best way, you know, he's the one that has to carry the load. He's the one that has to carry the heat of that. And so again, understand in his position, the responsibility, but we as husbands need to understand uh, that we have that responsibility on us. Now, I know saying all this again and knowing that we're the leader of our homes can add added pressure and stress. However, we need to understand that God will never ask us to do anything he's not given us the ability to do. You know, there are things that God asks us to do that if we put off on our wife, she's not going to be able to do that well, not because she's not as smart or doesn't maybe have the ability to some degree, but God has not given her what she needs to do that. God has given you as the husband to do that and vice versa. It goes both ways. We have different callings and different abilities God gives us. But we don't need to freak out. We need to realize that the Lord is the one that gives us this responsibility. He'll also be the one that gives us the strength and the ability to carry out the job. And as we said with the wives before, it's got to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, husbands, it's got to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be done in the power of the flesh. There's no way that we can do it that way. Now, let me say this. By this understanding of the responsibility that we have as husbands, there's also a very wonderful side effect in the husband's life. And that is if we truly understand that God's going to hold us accountable for our wives and our children and our families, guys, that is going to have the ultimate result of pushing us to the Lord. You know, when I realize that God's going to hold me responsible for where my family is and how my family is run, then that makes me run to God and say, God, you've got to help me because I see my weaknesses. I know them more than anyone. I know my inefficiencies. See, I grew up, I'm number four of four kids. 
And two of them were older brothers. And so it was easy to kind of follow them. You didn't have any choice. If you didn't follow, you were punched. The sister, well, you know, you, you could punch her. Even though I was the youngest, you got a certain age. You know, you knew that you ruled there. But the bottom line is still being the youngest, still being the youngest, the bottom line is, is that you learn to follow. You're, the youngest is not a natural leader. And so for me, when God called me, you know, into ministry, you know, that was an, an amazing thing for me. But before that, even calling me into marriage, that was a big step for me. And that was the step even that came before God called me into ministry as a leader because I was not a natural leader. I was a natural follower. And so God had to do a lot of work in my life and in my heart. And I'll tell you, as a husband, understanding that God has called us to be the leaders of our home, if you're not a natural leader like I wasn't, God's going to have to mold you and shape you and make you that. But you're going to have to step out in faith and let him do it. And it's a little bit scary. And it's a little bit intimidating because you know that you're supposed to be leading and you're going, I don't know where to go. But it's also a wonderful place to be because if you're supposed to be leading and you don't know where to go, what does that make you do as a husband? You've got to run to the one that's over you to find out where to go. And so you find yourself running to God saying, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's best for my family. Should we take that job? Should we not? Should we move? Should we not? What form of discipline should we have? How should I direct? What do we do, Lord? What direction in ministry and serving? All these things that we as a family have to look at. What do we do, Lord? And how do I do that? You've got to speak to me because I don't know. And so again, understand this, although it may be a scary place to be, it's a place that forces us to God. I think of Gideon. And here's Gideon. Remember when the Midianites were just intimidating and overwhelming the, the Israelites? Gideon's threshing wheat. And, and typically when you threshed wheat, you would take the wheat, you'd throw it up in the air and the wind would blow away the chaff. You would beat out the grains out of the, you'd pile it all up and you'd beat the grains out either by having an animal walk on it or beating it with a stick or running large stones over it or whatever. And then you would throw the wheat up in the air and it would blow the stalk away, the chaff. The wind would blow it away. We had to do that up on a hill. Gideon was down in this hole. He was down in this wine press, which is a, a lowered place, not an elevated place. And you go, it's exactly the opposite of where you need to be. And I get this picture of a guy throwing this stuff up in the air and dust falling back in his face because it's not going to blow away. And he's trying to separate the wheat from the chaff to get his food together, you know, et cetera, to make the bread and all. And the Lord shows up and says, hey, mighty man of valor. <laughs> I can imagine like, now if it wasn't for the shock of an angel showing up, the angel of the Lord showing up, rather the Lord himself, the messenger of the Lord being the Lord himself, if it wasn't for the shock of that, he probably would have been looking around going like, who's this mighty man of valor you're talking about? I don't see one. I'm kind of scared. And I'm down in this hole here because the Midianites are mean guys and I'm down there and we're intimidated. God didn't see him for where he was. God saw him for where he could be and what God would make him. See, God knew that underneath that scared man was a mighty man of valor, but he knew it would take the power of God to bring it out. And so he took this scared man with his knees knocking. He said, I want you to go and deliver the children of Israel. Some of you might be, and you would never admit that. You know, we can't admit that in this society that we're scared to lead or we're afraid we'll make a wrong decision because we grew up under John Wayne. You know, we got to make sure we know what we're doing, Pilgrim, right? You know, John Wayne, the only guy that can pull his gun out and shoot the ground and people over here fall, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's a tough man, you know, his bullet ricocheted from the dirt and hit his target. I mean, the bottom line is there's a hard, I think, for us as men to admit that, but to say, God, I don't know what I'm doing, and I do feel weak, and you've asked me to lead, and you're going to hold me accountable to lead, and my wife needs me, and my kids need me, but I can't do this. I'm scared. God says, now you're in a place where I can use you, finally, because now you realize that it's only by my might, my power, not by yours, that you're going to be the husband God's called you to be. So now yield to me, and I'll do it. See, that's how God does it. That's this wonderful place that God forces us to when we realize that we simply can't do this. And so, you know, God works in our life in that way. And God will use us as husbands to set the tone for our families and to set the direction for the way we're supposed to go because we're the leaders. So again, we see that as we get into today. Notice he starts out here in verse 25 and he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, Again, last week we saw that wives had one main instruction from the Lord in marriage, and that was simply follow the leadership of your husband. Let him be the leader. God's made him that way. God's designed him that way. Submit to him and let him do that. Remember, we, we don't have to go back and talk about what that means to submit. You know, if you weren't here, get the tape. It's not some type of lesser position. It's simply allowing God to use the husband in the position he's put him in, and all of us in the family operating in the different positions God has put us in. So that was the main instruction for the wife. Now we see God saying to the husbands, now husbands, love your wives. Here's the one main instruction. There's one main instruction for the husband. God keeps it simple because he knows there's guys like me out there. God, don't make this hard. Just love your wife. 
And I just, I guarantee you, husbands, if you just focus on loving your wife, everything else will fall into place. Now, of course, that's in light of loving the Lord. You love your wife, you love the Lord first, and then you love your wife. Everything else, we've talked about it before. If the vertical is in place in our lives as husbands, the horizontal will fall right in line. So understand that. The vertical in place, the horizontal is always going to be there. I think sometimes we try so hard to get the horizontal in place. You know, what can I do to make my marriage better? What can I do to make my kids behave? What can I do to get our home in better order? And we've got our eyes on all the horizontal plane, all these problems that we have. And God says, no, you got, you've got it backwards. All of those things are important, husbands. But you see, they're a result of getting the most important in line. And we talked about it last week. Remember, all marriage problems ultimately come down to our walk with God. And so what do we do? We get the vertical in line. First of all, now we get our eyes on God. We realize our responsibility before God as as the husband, trusting in his power, needing his power, needing his ability to do this. Now the vertical's in place. The horizontal just begins to fall in place. Now, again, it doesn't mean we live in some fairy tale world where there's no problems. But it means that now we've got the God part of it taken care of and everything else now falls into line, in line with that. And so we need to love our wives. And again, this is something that comes from having a relationship right with the Lord because we can't do it in our own strength. You know, a husband who will truly love his wife will rarely find a wife who will not submit to his leadership. You know, I didn't have any trouble following my pastor. I didn't walk around going, well, how come he's the senior pastor? Well, I should be. Well, I think I want to make the rules. I want to make the decisions. As a matter of fact, like I said, this is nice. I kind of like him having to be the one that all the weight falls on because if something goes wrong, it's not my fault. It's that guy right there. So if things go wrong, go to him. Don't come to me. I'm just his assistant. Wives, God has called you to be the husband's assistant. Something goes wrong, it's not your fault. Now, you may be doing your part, and that's we've talked about all that as far as making things go the wrong way. But you see, it falls on the husband. And so if a husband will simply love his wife, I tell you, it's a wonderful thing to have those that God puts over us. All of us are under authority. Every one of us, there's nobody in this room that's not under authority. And if you think you're not under authority, you're mistaken because you are. And if you don't allow that authority to be over you, then you're in pride. I mean, the husband, the pastor, all of us, the leaders, we're under God. We're under the Lord's authority. We're his assistant and what he's called us to do in ministry. And so, again, the wording here, interesting, he says, love your wives. The wording here means love your wife. And this is interesting to me, as a lifestyle. Note that, husbands. It doesn't mean just love your life as a one-time thing. It means to love your wife on a day-to-day basis as a lifelong thing. You know, it's not like, you know, honey, I told you at the altar that I loved you, and if that changes, well, I'll let you know. You know, I'll send you a letter or something or write something. No, it means every day she needs to know that she's loved. You see, I believe that our wives have a need to hear that they're loved on a regular basis, even as we as husbands need to hear the Lord loves us. Don't you need to know the Lord loves you, men? I do. I need to know the Lord loves me. I want to know I have his encouragement, his support, that he stands, that he's there as my authority, as the one who, who's I've submitted myself to. He's my Lord, but I need to know that he loves me, and I need his help, and I need his support. A wife needs the same thing. The same way as the bride of Christ needs it from uh, the husband, Jesus Christ, the bride in the relationship needs it from the husband. Sometimes life is hard, and we need to be reminded that we're not alone. Knowing that someone cares gives us strength and the ability to go on. There's that need to know that. And so I think wives need to know their love, not only in a verbal way, but also they need to be shown on a regular basis. Show your wife you love her. Just, you know what that has to be. It doesn't mean you have to run out buying big gifts all the time. I'm sure your wife would love that. But I think just doing something special. Yeah, maybe a gift ever so often, some flowers, something, just something to show her that you're thinking about her. You know, she comes home and, you know, you've cleaned the house. You've done the dishes. You know, the the kids have had their bath. Now that's a shocker, right? (laughs) As Tolly would say, there's a picture for you. So the bottom line is though, showing your wife ever so often in a special way that you love her. Maybe the things that she does on a regular basis, you just do it. Why? Just because you want to show her you love her. And when she knows you like she knows you, she's going to know that he loved me to do that. Right? And so again, show your wife in special ways. And next notice, husbands, how we are to love our wives. This is very intimidating for me as a man to realize the responsibility. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I could stop on the just as Christ gave the church and sit down and just kind of weep for a while. How in the world can I love my wife the way Jesus loves me? And when I realize my failures and my weakness, and then he goes on and just really piles it on. 
and gave himself for it. Now I've got, to, I've got to love her and give myself. This does not come by the efforts of the flesh. And I do not do this 100% of the time. Talk to Tracy. She'll tell you. But I know this is what God has called me to do, and this is why I'm forced to run to him and say, God, you've got to help me. I can't do this. But God says, I will help you to do it by my spirit and by my power if you'll run to me. See, it's a beautiful place. It puts the husband in a place of, of pressure, but it's a wonderful pressure because it drives us to our knees and to the Lord. Now, let me say this. First of all, biblical love is not bound up in feelings. Although that is a part, biblical love is a choice regardless of the feelings. And I think oftentimes this is why God tells the husband to love their wives because, you know, husbands are less feelings oriented than wives. Wives are more emotional. They base more things off of their feelings. And we can't go by our feelings, can we? We can't trust our feelings. And so we have to learn to, feelings are good. And I think God uses the wife to balance us out as husbands. She takes all these John Waynes and teaches them what it's like to have some feelings because we need that balance. But at the same time, because we're not emotions oriented or feelings oriented, you know, we typically don't, don't cry when we get a present, you know, or whatever the case might be. It's just not men. We don't do that. Well, because of this, we need to realize that even when we don't feel like it, our wives need to be loved. And so God sets us the example by saying, you know what? You've got to love your bride the way that I love the church. And since you don't base it on feelings, husbands, I want to show you that I didn't base it on feelings when I loved my bride, the church. Romans 5.8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. Note that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, here's the point. God loved us when there was nothing lovable about us. God didn't look at me when I was living in sin before I came to Christ and have feelings of that he really liked what I was doing and just watching my life made him just feel tingly all over. The Bible says that God hates sin. He loves the sinner. He loves us, but he hates sin. But he saw me in that sin and he saw me as his future bride, which I now am his bride, and he knew that I would be, and he loved me anyway. He chose to love me in the midst of my filth. Now, husbands, relate that over to our wives. Our wives are not in filth. Now, we may be married to an unsaved wife that is in the sense of, of sin or whatever. That can be a reality. But the point is, if God loved us in our filth, how much more should we be able to love our wives in them knowing the Lord? And even if they don't know the Lord, being able to love our wives as Christ loved us. So we, too, as husbands, love our wives, even if they're unlovable at times. There may be times when, you know, husbands, I know there's times when you are unlovable. You're not always that little teddy bear, you know. And there's probably times when the wives are unlovable. They're having a hard time. The Lord says, love them anyway. Show them grace. And sometimes it might mean nothing more than just be quiet. Don't respond. You know what I found? Whenever there's tension in our marriage, there's a tough moment where something's happened. You know, if I respond and start talking, boy, does that just throw gas on the fire. Isn't it interesting that it only took a couple of chapters in after God created everything for mankind to find a way to rebel? This is human nature, isn't it? Throughout history, God has something great in mind, but people find loopholes and do things their own way, rebelling against God. Something that's striking in the book of Genesis is that God remains faithful even when mankind does not. God keeps His promises when it would be impossible for anyone else to do so. What an amazing God we serve. Pastor Mark has been working his way through the opening book of the Bible, and there's so much more to gain from it. Come to the Table is a radio ministry of Calvary Knoxville. If you're enjoying these teachings, head over to thewaymedia.net to hear more. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. While you're there, if you have any questions or comments about today's message, we'd love to hear them. Just look for the questions and comments link. If you're ever in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love for you to drop in and see us. You can find service times and locations on thewaymedia.net. Scroll to the bottom of the page and find a link to Calvary Knoxville. We have several service times that could accommodate whatever type of schedule you have. We're so thankful that you've joined us today, listening to Pastor Mark's thoughts and insights on the book of Genesis. 
There's more to learn and appreciate from the beginning of the Bible on. So come next time, grab your Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, and be ready to understand the great things God has for you to learn the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.